You're listening to Accounted For, the Canadian podcast that explores the intangibles of every career. I'm your host, Daniel Lee. Hello, hello. Hey, everyone. Welcome back to Accounted For. This is the podcast on a mission to expand your perspectives, have you questioned the status quo, and help you get inspired to action for your own career. Thanks for joining me again on this wonderful Wednesday. I am recording this intro from beautiful, sunny Vancouver. I'm here for the next few weeks, and I've had I had this wonderful pleasure of recording this intro while witnessing this beautiful weather on the West Coast. Mm-hmm. So to my West Coast fans, hello, and to my East Coast fans, don't worry, I'll be back relatively soon. This podcast is part of OMD Ventures, my platform with a mission to build utopian organizations by unlocking human potential. And this might be a repeat message for my big fans, but to all you, my dear listeners, please know that um, OMD Ventures is a company that I started last year. And in the hopes of growing the platform further, I created a donation page at omdventures.com slash stakeholder. That's S T A K E H O L D E R stakeholder. It's not stakeholders with an S. It doesn't have an S. <laughs> and so on the page, I list out all the various ways you can support the podcast and just the overall platform, like all the other various content slash products that I create. And you can follow in all these different kind of channels. They're all free. And if you wanted to help out in any kind of gesture based way you can also donate a coffee to me and so that's a new feature i added where it's like you know if you would take someone out for a coffee to build a relationship or learn something new you would pay for that person's coffee and that's something i incorporated as part of the donation feature where you can buy me a coffee every month so or you can even buy me a coffee every week etc this is various options and that's something i can use to actually pay for my own coffees <laughs> as I work out of coffee shops or even pay for the coffees of people I would take out for coffee to bring on the podcast eventually. And any other proceeds will also help go to funding the operations of the podcast and the platform itself. So if you'd like to learn more, please check out the site at omdventures.com slash stakeholder. And I'll also provide the links down in the descriptions as well. And if you're also not a newsletter subscriber, please subscribe. It's all free. And you'll also be part of this community that includes people who are executives at Fairfax, partners at the Big Four. And it also keeps you really close to what I'm producing every week. So, yeah. Other than that, you know, spread the message. Tell your friends more about the podcast and also help rate it with a five star on whatever platform that you're using that allows you to leave a review all right cool now today's interview is with marie charrier i really hope i got that right (laughs) i've been practicing marie is the founder and ceo of sampler sampler is a toronto-based startup on a mission to transform the way consumer packaged goods companies distribute product samples And starting from creating her own idol competition in school to an OG hustler grandmother, Marie had planted seeds to be an entrepreneur early. And you'll really realize that when we go deep into that conversation. But it would be at the crossroads, really, of foregoing her London MBA and joining an incubator from a single cold email that would take her down this road to the seven-year journey in the startup world. And like many mission-driven entrepreneurs, Marie saw a problem that many of her CPG companies, like the, her CPG clients, faced from her advertising days. And over time, while she was on the startup journey, she found a way to tr- transition that knowledge to what is Sampler today. But I think what many don't think about, or maybe even like see, or maybe even just falsely assume, is that... Marie had to make like a sudden move to New York while she was in this incubator. She had to live in the quote unquote, I guess, unglamorous apartment outside Harlem by taking like a mega bus down from Toronto. She had to go through consulting days as she sketched and pitched the ideas of Sampler. And she had to go through various ups and downs throughout the journey. And all through that, she had to persevere 
to eventually build a company that is focused on honesty, something that we talk extensively about in this interview. And this was a super fun one where I just felt like I was talking to an entrepreneur who just totally understood the value of honesty at work and how she went about creating that kind of um, culture where honesty was a core pillar value. And also just the journey that she went through where I had all these assumptions where I read about, oh, so you worked at an incubator. It must have been super glamorous and you must have done all these cool things. And I'm just learning about, oh, no, yeah, like it had a lot of struggles and all the kind of difficulties that she had gone through. So this was a super fun conversation with me. And Marie has been super kind enough to even fit me into her busy schedule. And you also hear from the interview that she's just a super kind and nice person. So I really hope my chat with Marie really helps expand your perspective has you questioned the default and helps inspire action in you in some way. So without further ado, here's my interview with Marie. Hey everyone, welcome back to Accounted For. Today on the podcast, we have Marie Chavier. She is the CEO and founder of Sampler. Hey Marie, thanks for coming on the podcast. Hey, thanks for having me. Did I pronounce your last name correctly? <laughs> no one usually does. Oh, so man. I think I, I'm now convinced I pronounced my last name the wrong way and <laughs> I should just adapt. <laughs> How's the, how is the correct pronunciation? It's Chevrier. Chevrier. Yeah, it's okay. Chevrier. It's very French. Gotcha. Yeah, mm -hmm. I, I figured, but my French is very rusty. <laughs> so, Marie, for, for the audience who may not be familiar with your company, Sampler, can you tell us what the company does and the kind of yeah work you do with it? Yeah, for sure. So Sampler is the leading direct-to-consumer product sampling platform. So what does that mean? Uh, we help brands connect with consumers via product sampling experiences. So our mission is really just to help you find products that really match your lifestyle and help brands like L'Oreal or Kimberly Clark or even emerging brands like, you know, um, I'm thinking of some really cool emerging brands here like, um, oh my God, good uh, love for food, like really good emerging brands in different um, different categories, whether it's food or beauty. Uh, we're helping them connect with the right consumers through samples um, and doing that online. So instead of just, you know, getting a free cheese ball at Costco or a free drink on a street corner uh, randomly, um, now you can actually power the, the use the power of digital to to connect with consumers. Gotcha. And when you say like using the power of digital, is it that you are delivering stuff to the consumers? Yeah, yeah. So there is there is delivery. So how it works is you might come across a sampling opportunity online. It could be while you're browsing your Instagram or on one of your favorite websites. And uh, it will say, you know, want a free sample. And in order to access that free sample, you'll need to connect with Sampler. You'll give us your information. So that could be, you know, information around your skin type if it's a cosmetic sample or it might be about like how you drink your coffee if it's a coffee sample and um, in return you'll match with a free sample um, that'll get shipped directly to your home at no cost and uh, all we ask is that if you do get a sample we we love hearing from you and the brands do too so so we'll text you or email you a few days after you receive the sample and ask you for your feedback once you leave those reviews, we'll we'll leverage them to make the product better um, on the on the brand side, and uh, and the cycle will keep going. If you if you keep giving us some good feedback, you'll keep getting samples, and everyone will be happy. All right, I, I got to get my girlfriend to sign up for it too, then, so yeah. she can get some free samples. Yeah, yeah, women do really love free samples. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've operated sam sampler for i think close to like six years now mm -hmm. and that's a long time for an entrepreneur i find <laughs> i think I, I don't know what the inflection or the cutoff point of, of you know most people like quit in the year or two years yeah. but six years is definitely a venture but before being an entrepreneur i learned that you wanted to be a singer growing <laughs> up and so you, i think you, you grew up in montreal correct yeah yes i did yeah and when you were growing up what made you want to be a singer growing up Oh, I mean, um, Celine Dion, <laughs> probably. <laughs> I'm a huge Celine Dion fan. Uh, no, but um, I think like looking back, it, it's funny. Like, I mean, um, I think I always was um, someone who liked to 
perform, uh, whether that be, uh, you know, I did a lot of theater, I did a lot of singing. Um, um, I wasn't particularly good at neither of those, actually, unfortunately. I, I have a pretty strong karaoke game, but seriously, uh, yeah, singing is not my, my forte or acting, but, uh, but, but that's like, that's kind of cool. Like, it's cool now to look back to realize, like, I, I loved being in front of a crowd or I loved, uh, yeah, I loved, you know, performing and, you know, a lot of, a lot of leading a business or like going out for fundraising or, uh, presenting, uh, like, a lot of that requires a lot of the same skills that an artist might or that, you know, a performer might. So uh, some of those strengths, I think, like, uh, like showed up in a business setting. Um, and uh, so, yeah, it's, it's funny. Uh, it's, it's interesting. But yeah. <laughs> well, um, when you were growing up, well, what did your parents do? Were they in the performing arts section or entrepreneurship? <laughs> Not at all, yeah. So, so I, I get my entrepreneurial drive probably um, from, definitely from, from my parents, but even more from my grandparents. So uh, my grandparents actually owned a multitude of businesses, um, including a taxi company, um, as well as a, um, a convenience store. So like very, uh, very hardworking. I always joke that even today, my grandma is, um, is always looking for ways that she can continue working. Although like, obviously she's retired. I was actually at her house not so long ago. And she, um, she was talking to me about like, you know, she's been knitting like crazy because like, unfortunately, my, my grandfather passed away. So she like is keeping herself really busy with knitting. And we were talking about like launching your Etsy store. Like you cannot knock the hustle out of this woman's. <laughs> so, so yeah. So I think that's where I, I get a lot of like my hardworking sense. And yeah, the rest of my family is just as hardworking as well. So um, yeah. So I think that's like where I got the drive to just like really be passionate about my work yeah I, I would say that's definite passion right there <laughs> and it's something that's very like admirable like I, I I personally find any kind of entrepreneur or any kind of professional that works way past their retirement age to be of some kind of inspiration like mm -hmm. personally like Charlie Munger from Berkshire Hathaway yeah. is like a big idol of mine mm -hmm. and the man's half blind now I think he is losing sight in his one good eye but even at 96 he's still going strong and like attending I annual meetings yeah. and quibbing and talking smack about the financial <laughs> financial world so i think yeah like that kind of stuff you just you can't lie about it it's just very apparent and it's just yeah. inbred in the person yeah and for you then growing up what was your did you have like a entrepreneurial kind of tingling earlier on where you wanted to start something i know you started the high high school uh, <laughs> idol competition yeah is that yeah. was that the first foray into <laughs> I would say it's probably, well no my first foray would have probably been babysitting so a really funny fact um i started babysitting at like 13 and at age 13 i also had like a pretty bad phobia of uh sleeping alone or like literally like being alone at all which is like i'm, I'm laughing but it's like not funny at all because it was like obviously difficult for my parents who like had a 13 year old like sleeping in their bed <laughs> for, for a very long time uh, but funny fact is I literally was running like the entire neighborhoods um, like I had a, I had a started a babysitting business where not only was I babysitting but I also created my network of babysitters so like you could come to my babysitting business and I would refer you other babysitters because like I couldn't be in two places at once um, but I remember like even then like having the entrepreneurial drive like to go and do this business and to show up at like these people's homes and, and babysit their kids but having to call my mom to come babysit with me because I was too afraid to be alone in the home <laughs> Wow. So it's so funny. So entrepreneurship, like in this drive to do these things have actually, has actually pushed me to go above and beyond my fears a lot of times. And like babysitting is like that first babysitting job is probably the reason I was able to like develop that independence and in, in not being alone. So it's interesting how like somehow like my drive to be in business helped me achieve like so many of my fears, including flying alone for the first time or like you know so many other things later yeah. yeah and 
it's, it's fascinating. You've created like a marketplace business <laughs> at the age of thirteen. Like you, you, I like that you didn't stop. Like you didn't you didn't stop at oh I, I can't be a two please. I'll just I'll ha- just have my little clientele. <laughs> but no, you thought no, I'll just recruit. I'll, I'll yeah. just get bigger. Of I course. even got like the uh, my my mother used to work at the city hall, and I got her friends who were at the community center. Um, who would often get calls like for for like oh do you know a local babysitting business like I got them to use me as their number one reference like I had a referral system like I was pretty smart. <laughs> All right, yeah, you got your whole marketing channel down, got the organic growth. That's insane. Yeah, so so I guess like you don't know while you're doing it, but like looking back now, I'm like oh my god, like I it was definitely in me. And I think that's like so important, like if like if you're a parent and you're seeing some of these things kind of develop, like to to like really allow that to happen in, in your children. And like like that's definitely what my mom did. Like my mom knew that I would be a scaredy cat and that like by 1030 when it was dark and like there was scary noises and the kids were asleep that I would call her and ask her to come hang out with me. Um, but like she came and she was like very proud and like you know, like counted the paycheck with me and like was excited for me. So I think it's super cool. Wow. And so now from that, you went to study at University of Ottawa mm-hmm. and then you went to um, the advertising agency for work at JWT as like an account manager. Yeah. And I guess the corporate world just wasn't suiting for you because you went straight into the technology <laughs> entrepreneurship world in New York City with Rocket mm-hmm. Inter- Internet. And so yeah. how did that kind of shift happen in Rocket Internet for um Individ- like there are listeners who won't know it's it's a very big like incubator venture capital firm in germany it's like a public company it's huge with hundreds yeah. of people and so for a company even that's actually even like based in germany like how did you even discover that it's yeah. not even in the canadian ecosystem yeah so super cool and this is like this is the one thing i'll say is like i always say that um if you're if you're wondering like what to do next and you're you're like you're not sure have coffees because I like had one coffee um, at one point. So basically what happened is I was working in digital marketing and I loved my job. Like I loved working with brands. Like uh, when I was at, at JWT, I, I worked with, with consumer brands. So like, obviously this would serve me now, <laughs> but, uh, but at the time, like it's an agency and like, I just felt like I wasn't seeing the return on my hard work. Like it's a big company and you just feel like, you know, I'm, I'm pushing pen and paper, but I'm not like actually seeing the results. I feel like that's what happens in large organizations, unfortunately. So I wanted something else. And so I, I remember like literally Googling entrepreneurship, like being on Google and Googling that and, and then starting to think, okay, who could tell me about what it means to start a business? Like who could tell me about like, what are the first steps in starting a business? And I ended up finding um, a guy in Montreal where I'm from um who was the head of like the entrepreneurship society for montreal or something like that or the chamber of commerce something like that and um and i looked maybe at like hundreds of profiles that day on linkedin just trying to find the right person to like have a coffee with and i ended up like finding this guy guillaume and he and i sent one message that day sent it to Guillaume and I said, could we meet? And unfortunately he was really busy. So weeks went by, weeks went by, but I kept pushing and eventually he met me for a coffee. And lo and behold, Guillaume was actually just about to launch Rocket Internet in Canada. So he he and another guy that he was working with had been mandated to to launch this. And uh, he took a shot on me. Like he he saw during that coffee that I... Like, sure, I hadn't had the experience in venture capital or like I definitely hadn't had the experience scaling a business, but he saw I had the drive that I needed. And so I took that coffee he, or he took that coffee. And uh, yeah, so eventually what ended up happening is I moved to Toronto, like from Montreal for that gig. And within a week, they realized that like, oh, maybe it makes sense that rocket actually have its head office for um for north america and the us so they actually offered me a transfer to new york and at that point i went from like you know managing a small startups marketing to becoming an entrepreneur in residence at rocket in new york and it was it completely changed my life like 
Um, from that moment on, I like got to circulate across three different business models. One of them was a subscription box, which is like is exactly like in the product sampling space that I eventually now like I'm in. So learned so much there and eventually became the co-founder of a, a business called Drop Gifts, which ended up being my first failed startup. And, you know, like you need one of those. So so I got that. Um, and I ended up meeting my husband in New York. So, yeah, like sometimes these like pivotal moments in your life just happen. And, and uh, you know, I could have... I, like, I remember my mom thinking I was literally crazy. Like, what are you doing? Like, you like I had just recently moved back to Montreal after school. So it was like, it's like, now you're, why? Like, why are you going to Toronto? And then I call her, like, 72 hours later. And I'm like, actually, like, now I'm going to New York. And, like, <laughs> and they weren't paying for my travel. I had to take, like, a... Like I had to take a mega bus at like thirty two dollars. Like it was like it was like a mess, and I ended up like landing in Harlem at a, like a guy of a guy, like a friend of a friend's um, apartment. It was just like such a mess. There was nothing logical about the move, but it changed my life. I, I love the the picture you painted because <laughs> I feel coming from the kind of white collar profession world that I'm from, when when I imagined oh. Well, she went from an advertising agency to like an incubator venture fund in New York City. Oh, it sounds like a very glamorous, luxurious <laughs> move. But I love the picture you painted. Oh where it's my like God, no! Mega bus down into Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> Mega bus down into Harlem, like literally freaking out. What am I gonna do? Um, and and moving into like a company that was just setting up, and like we were working out of a co-working space. Like it, it was not glamorous at all, but. Um, but yeah, like I, I just made the most out of it and I, like my life would be so different if I didn't have that one coffee and it's yeah. so that, crazy to that think that. That single email yeah. that you decided to <laughs> that send. email, yeah. And even like going back to that, like when you're working at the advertising agency, you said you're working with all these big brands. And so amongst all that, where did the word entrepreneurship kind of pop, pop up to you I don't know like that is like that's also the other thing it's like I, I just think I I think I think at the time I really like I was thinking a lot about like digital marketing and like what's the next like next big thing and like you know at that time I remember like around the same time is the first time I posted an Instagram photo so I think it was like a very buzzy time like where like social media and like all this stuff was coming up so I wanted to get involved into that and I I think search after search it ended up being entrepreneurship but there's certainly like we're talking about um we're talking about what would it be like six years at sample like like 10 years ago so so 10 years ago, like, it's not like there was entrepreneurship, like, everywhere, right? No. So, it, so yeah, it's interesting. Yeah, it, I think about when I was in school, and it wasn't even that popular to work at Facebook then. No, like, yeah. And this was back in, like, I remember people were going for recruiting at, like, 2012. Yeah. Even then, people were like, ah, I don't know if I want to do, what? Yeah. Facebook's a startup. Do you really want to work there? Like, talking yeah. about that kind of stuff. But, yeah, like, definitely these times have considerably changed from that. And so then you, you're at New York, and this entrepreneur in residence kind of uh, occupation slash title, like it's it's not as common, but I've come across some other people who yeah. have been e EIRs inside yeah. like venture studios, incubators, and it seems like you're you're practically getting paid to help build companies, invest mm -hmm. in companies, and even like be a co-founder of one yourself. Yeah. Is that practically what the description yeah. was? Yeah, for, for me, it was um, it was being incredibly operational, actually. So I, I wasn't like I wasn't involved in any of the investment or anything like that or even the finances. It was about like taking an operational role in a startup where like there there was a need. So, you know, that could have meant, um, you know, I one of the startups I supported was HelloFresh, like back in the day, which is so cool. Um, and I remember like being on a task force that really uh, set up the first influencers behind in HelloFresh like wow. 10 years ago. Uh, that's like, kind of cool. And then on, on the startup, I ended up becoming a co-founder. Um, I was in charge of like a lot of the, the, the sales. So I was in charge of building relationships with potential retailers at the time um, and learned a ton. And, and then, you know, like when when it came time to, oh, we're, we're needing to like, 
you know, ship gift cards to people or things like that. I was the person that would do that. Like you, you just get your hands dirty. Um, yeah. And I, I, I think like it was, it was the best. And it's interesting. Like if anyone is on a crossroads of like, do I go to school or do I join a startup? Like I was literally in that crossroads. I got accepted into my MBA in London at the same time as I got the job at Rocket Internet and oh. I decided to do the job. Um, so yeah, and I like, thank God, because I think I would be in a lot of debt. <laughs> and like, not that I like, like I'm not because now I have a startup, but like, <laughs> but, but it's a, like, at least it's like earned uh, debt, I guess. Um, <laughs> I don't know, but it's, it's very interesting, like how, um, how that just kind of happened for me and I don't think I don't think I would be like I would be living a very different life I think if I had gone for the MBA yeah I gotta get back to that what <laughs> so after your time at um JWT you you had the I guess idea of going to an MBA that was yeah I guess that was pro- probably your primary primary option until that single coffee actually came through. yeah yeah so why sure. why did you choose to what, what were you going through in your mind as you're passing through like, you know, an MBA in London? It's so funny because now that I look back and like even at how I think about so many things, like I feel like we're all so um, vulnerable and we are so we are all like so um, what should I say? We, we all have this imposter syndrome, right? We talk a lot about imposter syndrome. We all feel not good enough. And like at that point, like when I when I wanted an MBA, like I literally just wanted to build my confidence. Like I feel like that I was thinking like, how can I build my confidence to like accelerate my career? How do I get like a fast pass? And a fast pass is like usually just like you you can get a fast pass in your career if you just believe you can most of the time, to be honest. And if you're willing to pay the, put the work, but like. Um, I, I, looking back, it was like such a psychological thing to go do my MBA. I mean, I had been in the business world like, or in advertising for like five years. I didn't need to go back to my, do my MBA, but I just like, I didn't feel secure enough to like make a big step or leap forward. And I thought I needed it. And then I realized like, you know what I can, if I can find somebody to take a shot at me and like throw me into the fire, um, maybe I get the same effect. And I'm so glad I did that because the reality is like looking at who I am as a learner, I am a learner that like just needs to figure it out herself. Like I need to, if, if we, given the first thing that you have to do as an entrepreneur, which is like just figuring out like the CRA and like how you set up your business and how you like get like registered as a business is like, it's so complicated. Like it's so silly, but you just have to like read a bunch of things. And then, then you have to like, hopefully like not forget this one registration. And then you have to like, it's like, it's, but you figure it out and you just have to like stare at the computer for a couple hours and just figure it out. So, um, so yeah, so I think that's what entrepreneurship does, like, and joining a startup in general, like, that's the one thing, like, I want to say as, is, like, a huge, like, signal is, like, you don't need to start your own business to be considered an entrepreneur. Every single person on my team is an entrepreneur. They they have, like, they show entrepreneurship qualities every single day because they have a function in the business that is completely undefined (laughs) and they have to just like figure it out every day they come here so um so yeah so joining a startup joining a young company um or starting a new initiative within your big company like that's entrepreneurship Mm -hmm. couldn't have said it better myself and i totally agree with the cra standpoint (laughs) i'm trained as an accountant like my my first career was as an accountant and as i like started this whole venture of mine i i had to go back and be like well I, I never learned any of this i never really learned how to set up a business or even register as like you know sole proprietor and i'm like okay i don't think i'm ready to inc- incorporate yet i'll be a sole proprietor what's the tax law there yeah and i filed my like for, first taxes as as a sole proprietor but school doesn't even teach you that even for an accountant exactly so, right exactly there's a lot of things you got to figure out and so for you as you start sampler um you said the vision the vision for sampler was to transform the way um, CPG companies, so customer packaged goods companies, um, distribute and distribute product samples. And this vision, 
what was the process like creating this vision? Did it, like, I can imagine it's a long kind of windy organic process, but if you could think back on it, what was, how did this vision kind of come about? Yeah. It's um it's accumulation of all of like my experience, whether it's handing out samples myself on street corners for a brand. Like I was one of those people handing out hummus at like at um, the Greek festival, like <laughs> it was like or, you know, giving out um, free samples of shampoo in a grocery store like those. That was me. So I feel like living the problem is a big thing. And I always find that. Um, if you are able to draw from your own experiences and your own frustrations, like it's a really good first competitive advantage. Um, but um, but again, like it would be a series of things that would have added up, like my ability to work on um, in New York. I got the opportunity to work on a subscription box like HelloFresh and I got the opportunity to be exposed to um, Glossy Box, which was another rocket Internet um a venture and in drop gifts the company that i ended up co-founding was about um gift cards so we got to interact a lot with retailers and i got to understand how retailers work like it's accumulation of all these things um but a story i i need to share more often that i never like think of is the fact that it sampler didn't start as sampler and like um initially like a lot of entrepreneurs sometimes are like kind of have an idea of like the thing I want to do and it might look like this it might look like that so what I did initially is I started a marketing agency I knew that I wanted I, I kind of knew I wanted to build something around product sampling but I wanted to validate my uh, my thesis by starting to be more of a consultant to CPG companies so I started my startup which was marketing shop and it was an agency that did social media management contests promotions and sampling and influencers and influencer work for brands in the baby category i had figured out that baby was probably going to be a big thing and um and i and i just serviced those potential customers for months just like getting into their heads like trying to understand like you're a brand manager what are you thinking about what are the big things you're thinking about and just making sure and proving my thesis around sampling and then I had a pipeline of brands that I could talk to about my new product. So I remember one of my clients at the agency that I had built, and it was like me and one more person running that agency. And we had like, we had five clients on retainer like very quickly. So it allowed me to like bring some cash in that would actually like eventually fund the first version of Sampler. Um, but uh, they're like, if you are currently in a role where you're working full time, think about is there is there a consultancy that you can build that's kind of close to where you want to eventually be so that you could be talking to your target customer every single day. Right. And so that's what we did. Um, but anyways, I remember like taking Photoshop um, mock ups of what sampler might look like and going to my um, retainer customers and saying like, would you buy this? Would you buy this? And eventually one of them actually was like, oh my God, this would be so cool. And then I sold it to them. I sold them these mock-ups and they thought it was a real thing. <laughs> and then the next day I was like, oh crap, now I need to go get a software developer. <laughs> so that's like, that's, that's, I think like the thing is like, you don't need to like wake up one day and say, I'm building a business and I'm I'm investing a million dollars in building a platform and like go to market first, like validate your concept, make sure you have a buyer and then and then go for it. And so when you were running marketing shop, the agency itself, well, you said you were working on like social media stuff, yeah. brand brand marketing. Um, was there something like different you're trying to do with that as well? Was what was the initial kind of thesis behind that? Like, why did you start a consulting business coming out of? rocket internet because that's how i could pay the bills while i figured out like what to do with with sampler and mm. like like it, my concept with sampler was definitely i wanted to digitize product sampling but i didn't have the funds to like ba build that and i needed to you know keep that going without needing without going to a full-time job so yeah. yeah that makes sense for me I, like that's the kind of journey i've been going on myself yeah and, there you go but and but before th this, you had drop gifts, and mm -hmm. you said that failed. <laughs> Can you tell me about why that was like? What you mean by it failed, and why yeah. didn't it deter you 
from mm-hmm. entrepreneurship. Oh like, my God, it drove me so much more. So yeah, yeah so so Drop Gifts was one of the startups that Rocket um, was working on and um, I ended up, you know, working on it for the US. And um, yeah, so at the time, um, there was a huge trend in market called social gifting. So the concept was that um, you as a consumer, you know, obviously we all get these notifications around like someone's birthday on Facebook. But maybe there was an opportunity for you to send a friend a, a gift card, a Starbucks gift card on their birthday instead of actually just like wishing them like a happy birthday on their Facebook wall, right? So the concept was that on the friend's birthday, you could send them a gift card instead of actually um, just the, the, the greeting. Um, and uh, there was a lot of companies in that space, actually. Um, there was Rap. There was um, a few others. And... Um, what ended up happening is like one of the underdogs in the space that you know you would never like we would never really hear about it was called karma um they got acquired by facebook um so here we were building a platform and at the time like a lot of technologies were actually heavily reliant on facebook we were we were a facebook app like literally we send gift cards through the facebook app through people's birthdays announced on Facebook. So when Facebook buys your biggest competitor, there isn't much of a play left. So um, it taught me a lot about platform dependency and like I'm just being careful about like who you're, who like you're relying on when you're building an ecosystem, right? And um, and uh, yeah, so I mean, that's that was a great learning, um, but I I realized like then that you know um, I had it in me I like I was I was so angry and passionate and like yeah passionate and love like happy mad every single potential emotion you could have going into work every single day at that company that I was like this is what I need like this is what I want and and I still I still am so much like I. I love coming into work every single day, um, and um, and I like I'm I'm on I'm always like it's the best life. Like you you just like you're so passionate. Like who can wake up every day and say like I I just can't wait to go to work or mm-hmm. or or sometimes like oh my god work is like is so challenging and but like but 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 I, we feel like and we 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 we're part of something and it's like it's just yeah i just i just got hooked <laughs> yeah it seems got like hooked you got very addicted to that feeling very quickly <laughs> and, and so then from there like you made the first pitch and i think i learned that it was it's like a five thousand dollar check yes that was, that was yes. the first sale Woohoo! <laughs> and you also talked about in like a previous interview of how you know you first focused on building relationships with the small clients and mm-hmm. making mistakes early with the small yeah. clients instead of butchering it with like L'Oreal. <laughs> and but what was the process like earning the trust for like you know getting like the first ten small clients when yeah. nobody knows who you are and you know you got the five thousand dollars and you even had to just go out and now get a developer and pitch to that that yeah. person in Germany at, yeah. about how all right, we're going to build this. I have the money. Let's, let's do it. <laughs> I have $5,000. Um, yeah. yeah. Could you even pay the developer? <laughs> uh, no, we didn't pay him. No, no. He um, he ended up joining as, a, as like, at the time a co-founder. And, and eventually, like, eventually he decided to, to not stay as a co-founder, but more so. Um, but he's still today an equity holder in the company. So, yeah. So he's, he's still. And it's funny because six years later, um, I actually got invited to speak in Berlin uh, on the tech open air stage. Um, so it's like a really cool tech conference that they do there. Um, and w- one of our recent investors is actually based out of there. So that's how this came about. But I'm going to meet up with him. I'm going to meet up with Christian who built um, the first lines of code. And um, and we're going to, we're going to, you know, reminisce and, <laughs> and think wow. of the time that I like convinced him to do that. But no, I mean he, he's uh, he's to be thanked for that. Like I, if if he said no that day, I don't know that we would have been around. Mm-hmm. So, 
And that, I think you said that was like the only developer you knew. It's the only developer I knew in the world, like the world. <laughs> wow. And so then, what what was it like? Um, like, did it take a year to get your first like ten clients, or did it take like two years? What was no, the grinding actually, like? Yeah, sampler sampler um, got picked up pretty quickly. I think we I think we would have been at forty brands after one year. So oh, we, I guess it yeah, was, it was very obvious to yeah, the clients. It was obvious. So to your question, which was you know, how do you convince those first ten? Um, there is like what is clear to me still today is like you really have to understand what's at stake for this person and why this is something that is should be a top three priority every day like every every person you sell to um can only probably focus on three things right and and that's probably three things they can only focus on for the year so um, especially when you're talking to emerging brands or SMBs that have, don't have a lot of money, why should why does your service why should your service be a top three priority for me is the way you should always be positioning it. So um, when it comes to digital product sampling for emerging brands, I mean, still today, I think it's absolutely the top. Th- it should be in the top three priority because brands that are that brands that I was talking to at the time and still am today are um, don't have retail channels the same way that the large brands do, right? So they have limited resources to put their products onto shelves. Re- like if you're, um, they they instead have decided to build digitally native um, brands. They their shelves are their websites, and so the largest priority for them is driving demand to that website right um or driving demand so there are other channels like amazon um and if you and and so the the simple question that i always ask is what makes your product so special and every time someone says if i'm asking that to you as like as someone who maybe created a brand new granola bar 99 percent chance you're going to answer it's the taste it's the feel it's the touch it's the packaging whatever whatever you answer ingredients it's all of that is a physical experience it's not something you can actually taste online it's not something you can taste with a banner ad it's not a you cannot understand some a products a products differentiation through traditional ads um so sampling is a no-brainer right um so so yeah so it was just about explaining to them that sampling is a really, really viable vehicle and uh, for them to convert people and that they would be able to leverage that sampling activity to their CRM or to their other initiatives and helping them understand and educating them on how that plays into their their day-to-day and um, their other priorities as well. So, yeah, I mean, it's all about positioning it as, like, why is this a top three priority for you right now? I yeah, think I think... I think that's a very beautiful tip that you gave for <laughs> any like, entrepreneurs or even just regular people just to think about when st- trying to sell something. And you brought up a good point about how the it's true. Like I think the brand model is constantly evolving. And if we just think about advertising, it it used to be billboards, and mm-hmm. you just leave it there, and people go, "Oh yeah, I'm inspired by that." And <laughs> but now it's becoming more about a brand being an experience. It's not even just. A logo it's actually the full feeling you get when you look at it and when you Absolutely. use the product and with with that kind of i think change like why do you think it took so long for companies to like, think about like this kind of sampling method like seeing you guys and going oh yeah that's obvious but why didn't anyone else exist before that why do you think so great question so i mean at a basic level um ads used to be incredibly effective like like TV ads, mm. literally in in the time where like advertisement is about attention, right? And there was a time where ninety five percent of people watch TV every night at seven p.m. Like there was a time where not ever like pretty much like you could reach ninety five percent of the of, of like like a very large percentage of Canada if you advertise at seven p.m. Right and. There was a time when there was like 10 channels <laughs> and eventually we had 300 channels and eventually we had not only 
only like TVs, but we also had computers and then we got mobile devices. The the mediums got highly fragmented, right? And so and so that happened, which was, you know, unfortunate and uh, well or like, you know, very unfortunate for the big media houses who in the past just had to build advertisement that said literally my uh my my dishwash soap cleans better than this dishwash soap literally the only thing you had to say and you and you said it in a 30 second segment with a smiling woman and 90 and 95% of Canada would know that your your dish was so much better but the, it got media got fragmented aside from that the the grocery stores the pharmacies all of the different products that we are being presented got fragmented a million times more if you think about how many peanut butter um, types of companies you could pick from 20 years ago skippy and craft right now you have like holy crap there's a there's a nut i didn't know about for and and it's become a peanut butter every freaking day we have sunflower we have sunflower butter we have like cashew butter we have every butter i'm like so confused so the messages are so confusing right so um so why weren't people paying attention before is because there was cheaper ways of like driving their message um but now i believe that because those new channels of like even new new channels like like uh, instagram or things like that um those are also getting fragmented and and the messages are getting like busier and busier and it's it's just very distracting um and so what what i love about that because it sounds all very negative but what i love about that is that it's forced us to create really amazing products if you think of the fact that brands now have to be transparent about their ingredients or they have to be transparent about their values they have to talk about where are they putting the like they have to dedicate a portion of their of their um proceeds to foundations sometimes to attract to you um i think that's really great they have to be transparent about their packaging they're this, we're creating amazing brands but how do you deliver all of that in a 10 second instagram video you can't so it's about experiences it's about i'm going to receive a product in my home and with that product is going to be amazing packaging um and a little info card that tells me that this brand actually donates 10% of their proceeds to this foundation and then you know there's a follow up email that comes in and it tells me a little bit more about that foundation and now i feel so much closer to that brand and then i learn about the founder and i learn that actually that founder is from you know a small town in pei and like she has this amazing story and like now i feel connected to her and like i want to support her um so brands are tasked with you know creating these one to one relationships in very dynamic ways and it's 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 incredible and i think that a lot of people have done a great job at it um but yeah it's it's very complicated <laughs> no but i think i think you put it quite eloquently well where it's yeah there's a lot of noise out there and to cut through the noise and be a signal in it you, mm-hmm. the experience has to matter yeah and you brought up the you know the need for companies also to be transparent and uh transparency and honesty is like a big part of Sampler's culture and I want I was curious was, was there like a particular moment where you really felt like this was something you wanted to really bring into the culture of the company as like a core principle like I asked that because when when I was starting out in the corporate world I I I was naturally like as a person who who feels like sick to his stomach when I'm not honest but <laughs> when you are going when you're recruiting people can't tell you fake it till you make it and the first time I was truly honest was I was at the end of my first co-op term in accounting and I had to do a performance evaluation and the I think the question was like what what could you improve upon or what would, what did you not do well and I I wrote down I had no idea what I was doing I copied everything from last year <laughs> and I I told people I knew what I was doing and I didn't know what I was doing so I lied to my manager and I just wrote all that stuff down and then my performance manager called me back and he said this is the most honest performance <laughs> review I've ever read and it's probably the only true one out there. Yeah. And he's like but we just have to rewrite it so you, you don't get in trouble. Yeah. And so we fixed it up but that was a big trigger point for me where I actually got 
complimented for mm-hmm. it. And so that kind of positive reinforcement got yeah. me down this path of always being honest and extremely candid. And yeah. so I'm wondering for you, like, bringing that kind of culture and transparency, a culture of transparency and like, honesty into the company, what was the kind of the motive behind that? Yeah, so I'm actually exactly like you. I wear my emotions on my sleeves. I don't like I will feel sick to my stomach if I'm being dishonest. And um, so for me as a leader who, you know, as a leader, sometimes like they, everyone says you you have to be the fearless leader, which well, like there's no leader that is fearless. Like every single leader is shitting their pants. Like they literally, I, I need to stop saying that. I say, I, I've actually, I said that on beta kit the other day and they like, and it's like a headline now. <laughs> Marisha <laughs> Ray said, um, yeah, anyways, I said it again. Dang. Um, anyways, but, but no, every single one of us is like really scared. Like how could you not be scared? We're all like, we're all making really, really big bets and, We have, you know, like I have 30 people's lives like that I like that I'm impacting every day, like on a good or a bad decision I make. Right. So, um, yeah, so everyone's everyone's every leader has a level of insecurity. And um, and at one point I realized that me trying to like hide that insecurity or me trying to not be myself every day was something I just couldn't do. Like, I just I just couldn't, like, if I was going to get up with the same level of energy, I just needed to be able to come in and be like, man, girls, like, I, I, I didn't sleep last night. I was really thinking this one, about this one part of the business and I need to workshop it, right? And, um, and I think that that, so I, I always was like that myself. Um, and just recently, um, I was so excited because we did a values workshop for the company and um, I actually by design wasn't actually allowed to participate in most of the activities so that the team could define who they were because to be honest like the team we have today is exactly who I want to hire for the future of this business is like they, they, they are absolutely the perfect group um, and so it made sense to just let them define and the first thing that came up was transparency they they define transparency as our number one value and um and it was really great because in the meantime while i was hiding in another room i wrote down what i thought was like my biggest value as a as a person as a human and it was transparency so we were very aligned on that and like that's not i think my my daily like way of being probably um, attracted other people that like that, but but it's who they are too. Yeah, and I think just based on like the kind of coaching and research that I've done, transparency is a very big thing that yeah. is a key motivational factor for most individuals that seems to not be as apparent, I think, in many corporate cultures. Mm-hmm. And, and for you though, despite having 30 amazing people in your team, <laughs> you're still you're a solo founder, and I think a solo founder is relatively rare in the tech ecosystem. And I had a venture capitalist come on a podcast who anonymously, we had an anonymous episode, and the venture capitalist shared that, yeah, you know, it's, it's an unsaid kind of thing where we kind of look for a three founder team with the archetypes of you need a sales guy, an engineer, and an ops person. And we always look for that kind of trio in the founding team. And so I'm wondering for being a solo founder, what kind of obstacles like did you experience kind of building up sampler and trying to mm-hmm. fundraise and pitch to investors and also just personally how do you deal with the kind of noise in your head being yeah. that solo founder yeah i mean i never like i never like f- to me founder is a title and like it's it's that's it like i always had a rock star team behind me like i never was alone i never felt alone i there's definitely nights that like you like you can you can tell yourself like oh like like you can freak out about like you know it's my responsibility it's my responsibility but it's not like um i have such an amazing executive team behind me and with me every every day so um i never shy away from you know if i'm meeting investors being like 
here's Eric, our chief product officer, who like has been with me forever and is pretty much like at this point a, a founder just as much as me for for having been here this long. So um, I think that I think that we that we need to just continue to highlight the other people on the team that are like really quarterbacking it. So I, I have I have that trio. Um, they weren't there like the first day that we started, but I've always I've always had a trio of like in even more like we have you know great great leaders and product great leaders and operations great leaders um, in sales great leaders in marketing like on our management team. So I've been lucky that way to surround myself with the right people and um, and yeah I think I think that's. But but yeah, I, I I could see I could see why investors would <laughs> would find that challenging. Yeah. Um, but you see, but like I I I get asked often by investors like I think when they dig into like who I am as a as a founder like the I could they I think they'll dig into like the type of talent I attract and my ability to keep talent around and that type of stuff. And if if you have that in a founder, then then you know it doesn't matter whether someone's someone's a founder or not mm -hmm. and i think as you're telling me this the core value of the transparency keeps them knocking on my head as well where it's like mm -hmm. yeah because you know usually you know sometimes you have a co-founding team because sometimes a co-founder wants to share something to another person and sometimes they don't want to share it to an employee and yeah. they like frighten them but if you have a culture where everyone is very transparent and very honest then yeah. you don't really feel alone you don't feel yeah. like you can't really say anything and feel yeah. like you're crazy and sometimes you do but i try and break out of that like yeah. seriously like last weekend i was freaking out about like some of the feedback that we got about something and um i spent the entire weekend like freaking out being like oh my god oh my god how am i gonna come to how do i how do i solve this before monday is what i had in my brain and then i and then i woke up on monday and i was like okay it's still not solved but like Thank God, because I have like an amazing team and I'm going to walk in and I'm going to say, let's go to the whiteboard and let's figure this out. In one hour, we figured it out mm -hmm. in one hour. Like, it's just like, I think that we need to, I think that if you hire the right people, the, they can, they can, they will appreciate, they will appreciate the transparency and the, the ability to be part of those big decisions. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned previously about how a very important thing for entrepreneurs is to build a cheerleading team, like with yeah. advisors, mentors. You did your research. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, and so like your team of advisors, people that you work with, mentors. I find for me, when I have mentors or, or advisors, it's a very organic process where you meet someone and then you want to meet them again. And over time, it mm -hmm. becomes a stronger relationship. But when you look back, do you find that there was some kind of pattern? Was there like a theme where you felt a certain way about someone and you go, oh yeah, I think now when I feel something like that, I'll know like in mm. a gut decision sense. Yeah, I mean, I think in different, um, at different stages of the company, I've looked for different people to surround myself with. Um, but um, like, so for, for instance, very early on, like I needed, I definitely needed like, um, it, like I still, you always need a cheerleading team, but I needed people that like, really saw the vision and and could could like really help me put it into words on and like into business models and like um and help me like clearly figure out the next steps and stuff like that um and so like my like my first big mentor was our first investor michelle mcbain who is this amazing woman who actually just raised um a venture capital fund um called um stand up ventures um and um and she's she's also she invests in 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 women primarily under that vehicle but also part of mars if um anyways she she was my first cheerleader she like she like she wasn't just an investor like i immediately like when i walked into the room i could tell that what she wanted was for me to win and she may or may not invest um but she was gonna sit with me and help me win, uh, even if it meant winning her <laughs> her support. So I remember just like, you know, there's people you meet that you're like, they genuinely want to help. And, and that that's like what I look for an investor. Like um, we could, 
we be, finding an investor is such a partnership. Like um, we could sit across and you can you can challenge my business model all you want, but at the end of the day, what what you want to figure out is is this someone that I could work with? So why not sit on the same side of the table? And that's what Michelle did that day. She sat on the same side of the table. She went through the um, she went through the um, financial model with me, and she talked. She she thought a lot about. She she helped me think about you know how I should be thinking about the business in the future. And through this through this conversation, she identified that I was highly coachable, that I had the ability to figure it out, and that the business model was was looking really really good, and that I had some good traction. So uh, that was initially. But now like I now I'm really focused. Um, now I feel like. I look for people that challenge me. Like mm-hmm. if you, if I walk out of the room feeling like crap, I never thought of that. <laughs> if I, if I, if I'm like crap, oh, I'm so smart. I, like if I leave and I'm, I'm like physically uncomfortable, I'm, I'm like, I need this person because <laughs> right now I'm just like in this, in this phase where I, I want my ideas to be like, challenged and and making sure that I'm thinking about every problem in every single like facet so yeah it depends but you should yeah you should I think it's one of those two either you feel extremely supported and um and you have an ally to figure things out with or someone that really challenges you or like the two types of mentors that are pretty cool to have excellent and I think as we kind of wrap up on like the final legs of interview I think that's a good way to kind of leave off for our final kind of few questions what in a previous interview you said you said an advice you'd give to entrepreneurs is to just go for it Mm -hmm. and I'm wondering if if you could think back to the 20 21 year old Marie maybe I think she'd probably be in like University of Ottawa just about to graduate (laughs) or just before so is that the same advice you'd give to that Marie or would it be different given what you know now yeah no I'd say um I'd say just like just go for it for sure another one that um that I love to say is um think big because no one will stop you we Mm. often say that in the company and I think it like my 21 year old self um was thinking big like I remember like in college when I worked I as a um I I worked at a like I worked at at a bar like as a bartender and I decided that I want I didn't want my title to be bartender. I wanted to be marketing manager. <laughs> and what that meant was just that sure I would bartend, but I would also choose the theme for the night and I would get my friends to come. Um, but I went to the bar manager and I said, I want to be marketing manager. And I was thinking big and like and the thing is like, why would he stop me? I was I was wanting to do more work. I, I was wanting to do more work for the same salary. Um, um, but just have a different title. So um, th- like at that time, that was like me thinking big. But for us today, it might mean, you know, launching something like Retail TO, which is a, a quarterly meetup that we've that we've partnered with Tech TO to run. Like our team is not, we're not event planners. We were really focused on building a business. But, um, you know, that partnership really helps us connect with brands quarterly and, and really push on our mission um so yeah think big no one will stop you and just go for it uh no one will stop you (laughs) great advice and is there something today that you know we didn't talk about or cover that you wanted that you wish we did or that you kind of wanted to leave our audience with aside from the great advice you gave um can't think of anything um really just you know um soup i'm super passionate about brands and and uh retail and certainly happy to connect with anyone that's kind of thinking of that space right now. If you're building a brand in Toronto, um, in the consumer package goods space, I'd love to help you out building it. Um, like, I think that's the only thing. All right. And so how can they reach you and get in contact with the company? Yeah, definitely. I think like I'm actually a super user of LinkedIn, so you can definitely connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, I love connecting there. And then, uh, our website is, uh, sampler.io. Excellent. All right, Marie, thanks so much for coming on the podcast and Thank sharing you. your story with my listeners and myself. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay, bye. All right, thank you for listening to the podcast. 
I hope the story was inspiring to you. It Hopefully it also helped you expand your perspectives. Hopefully it also made you question the default path that you might have been going on or the default beliefs you might have had. And maybe now it'll make you even think about doing something about it, doing something different maybe, challenging yourself, being courageous. Who knows? But regardless, I'm really happy that you took some time out of your day to listen to this fantastic story with my guest. And if you would like to somehow, in some way, contribute and help support the podcast and maybe even just be part of the community that I'm trying to build with the greater OMD Ventures platform, really think about being a stakeholder in the platform. And the quick way to do that is to go to my website, oldmandan.com, and go to the stakeholders page. I believe it's oldmandan.com slash stakeholder. And the link is also down below. And that's how you can figure out how you can subscribe, follow to get more updates on the free content. But at the same time, also donate and donate by actually just buying me a coffee. That's just how I put it. And you can buy me a coffee a month, coffee a week, or coffee every day of the year. And think about it as the way that you know, if you wanted to chat with me, you might just bring me out for coffee and buy me a coffee. Or if you wanted to bring one of my guests out to chat, you might buy them a coffee. So I'm just think of it as I'm the service that's doing that for you. So you can just pay me in coffees. <laughs> Don't worry. Uh, everything will still be free. It's just It would just really help if you would like to show your support this way so that I can use the coffee money to buy myself actual coffees and also to buy my guests actual coffees at and use the leftover money to actually grow the platform as well as even keep it operationally alive as well because it all this is, isn't really free and it does take a lot of time to build it as well as operate it and hopefully grow it further. So your support would be amazing if you would like to contribute. And so yeah, just check out the website, go to the stakeholders page and read the different kind of benefits you might even get as a stakeholder. All right, thank you.